Today I'm going to talk about Chevy Silverados. This particular one is a 2015 LTZ. Pretty much top of the line for them. That's a sharp looking pickup as you can see. And it's kind of a show truck because as you can see here, it's got the short bed on it. It's not a full size bed. It's more of a show off truck than anything else. Look at the rims. They're not made for going through mud. <laughs> but as you're going to see here, you can already see the quality is kind of cheap. Okay, that's unlocked, that's locked, that's unlocked. But look, you pull on it, nothing happens. You gotta jerk around. It's just cheaply made tailgate. I can feel the plastic already coming apart. Five years old and the latch is starting to go. I know it's gonna snap off. I've fixed a bunch of these. Come on now, Chevy. This was a $43,000 truck when it was new and it's only five years old. Cheap plastic crap on the handles, it's a truck. Come on. Now when we check under the hood, it's got a nice V8 engine, which not 355 horsepower, but of course all that power comes at a price on a big heavy truck. This particular one gets about 15 miles a gallon in town, 1920 on a highway. Now as we check the interior, comfy truck, lots of room, turn the key and yeah it's still got a key which I like. Starts right up, got all the electronic stuff but it doesn't have that many miles on it. It's got 67,201 miles. And that small miles and barely five years old, it's got a big problem. Got the AC on low, but it just got room temperature air coming out of it. It's losing the refrigerant, the customer filled it up and it lasted a few weeks and now it's blowing warm again. I made a whole video on this, you can watch it, but basically what I did was, I emptied it all out with my recycling machine, I filled it back up again, put leak dye in it. Normally you'll see where the leak has come with a dye, but it didn't show anything until I got my sniffing machine out. It smells refrigerant leaks. That's a normal beep. When it beeps fast, means there was refrigerant leak. But as you can see there, it checks for other gases too. I just ate a couple of tacos and I guess they're all gassing from my mouth because it's beeping from that. But in this case, when I stuck it inside the AC dash, it started beeping, meaning that the evaporator inside the dash is leaking. Now it's bad enough that it's leaking. Due to their horrendous modern designs, this is a fifth hour job tearing the whole dash apart to replace it. It's well over with parts and labor and everything, a $2,000 job on a vehicle that's just barely five years old. It's got 60,000 miles on it. To me, that's uncalled for. That is just poor manufacturing by GM. Like I've been saying, they don't make the greatest stuff anymore. Now it's bad enough that it's leaking, but in the olden days, the GM truck, they had the evaporator here under the hood. I could change an evaporator out in about an hour. Not 14, 15 hours, one hour. But they decided to move it all inside. So you gotta take the whole dash apart. And like I say, it's a 14, 15 hour labor job. And the cost of labor, the cost of parts, it'd be around 2,000 bucks to fix the stupid leak on something that shouldn't have leaked that fast. Again, here's my 94 Celica, 240,000 miles, old as the hill, still got the original evaporator, and still blows freezing cold. GM? Quality, it's not there anymore. Now this baby's got all the creature comforts. It's got heated and cooled electric seats. And when you go in the back, you can see the back seat isn't a joke. It's got a lot of space to sit in. A nice little area to put stuff in. Cheaper quality and design. They didn't even have air conditioning system blown out here like the Toyota Sequoia I showed the other day. You just get in the air from the front. They could have easily put vents in here, but I guess that would have cost them too much, or maybe they couldn't figure out how to do it. More interested in having an armrest that's got cup holders in it. Now you're not gonna get stuck with this thing, cause you can see here's the front end, and there's the drive shaft on the right side. It's all wheel drive, so you're not gonna get stuck. In the back, it's got a big beefy rear end here. Gotta put oversized shocks on it. Got a big old spare tire under here. You know, it's a solid built truck. No arguing that. And as I say, when you climb inside, bloody comfy. It's a nice comfy big truck. Traction control on or off, and you can adjust the pedals and stuff. You know, it's got a lot of creature comforts. So there's no arguing that. So let's start it up, take it for a spin. Got the obligatory backup camera. Now it's got decent cornering for a big old pickup truck. We're not gonna have to wait for this guy who rudely pulled out in front of us. Isn't that typical these days? It's got some pickup. Big old engine. 
Hey, it rides like a typical pickup truck, you know. You're gonna feel bumps. They're sloshed out by the weight and everything. But you see, when we get these bumps, it, it rumbles around. It's a pickup truck. It's not a Lexus or a Cadillac, you know. It's a pickup truck. But for a pickup truck, really? Got a pretty smooth ride. Comfy enough when you're going straight and not hitting any big bumps. And if you're used to driving land yachts around like I did when I was a young kid, you kind of point and steer, you know? It's not the crispest of steering, but you know, it's a big old truck. That's what it's gonna act like. And like I said, it's got a pretty cavernous back seat, you know? Climb inside. It's not particularly cramped. This isn't a tiny little back seat. It's got plenty of room. But I do have to say, for almost $50,000 five years ago. And this thing already needs $2,000 plus of air conditioning work on it. The quality just isn't there. He's had this Tucson for a little over a year and a half now and realized he's leasing it because he was gonna get a Toyota RAV4. But there were two things that bothered him. The first was this Tucson has a nice screen integrated with the dash where the Toyota had that one that looks like somebody stuck an iPad there and he hated it. And the other thing he hated was the price. He's leasing this, 210 bucks a month. The RAV4s, they were 350 bucks a month and up. And you're not gonna believe this, but it's the truth. This was a new model that just came out. The saleswoman at the Hyundai dealer told him, no, don't buy this car, lease it. She said, it's a new model, things might go wrong. You won't have to worry about anything because you're leasing. And if you like it later, you can always pay off the lease. And he's got another year and a half left on the lease. And he just told me, I ah, doesn't know, he'll probably get rid of it and get something else. As a compromised vehicle, mainly because of the price, and he really hated that iPad looking thing in a Toyota. I tend to agree. It's intrusive to the design of the car. And it's kind of annoying that you got this bump sticking up there. I gotta agree with him that. But considering that he gets 39 miles a gallon on the highway when he was driving at regular speeds, good gas mileage, he didn't have to worry about the repairs because he doesn't own it, he's leasing it. Black and silver interior, we'll start it up. It's got cool looking digital dashes, I'll say that. Got a nice display, the sunroof, collision avoidance system, air conditioned seats, different speeds, heated seats, different speeds, both sides, easy to get to. So anytime you want to look back, just put your back camera, there's a view. You don't have to be in reverse, handy little thing. I even like the cool rolling volume for the radio, look at it. Really easy to use. And when you turn the thing off, watch. Happy music. Now when you consider he's only paying 210 bucks a month to lease it. Hey, nice looking vehicle. It's got a lot of room for the back seat. Has heating and air conditioning in the back seat. It's comfy back here. You can easily get three people in there or have a nice armrest with cup holders. Now, this is a two wheel drive version, but he follows my videos. He lives on the East Coast. You put snow tires on the front of this thing. He doesn't get stuck anywhere. If you do get an all wheel drive vehicle, and one tire goes bad, you gotta buy all four. That's a lot of money every time you get a flat tire. The all wheel drive systems, all the tires have to be almost exactly the same size. Cause if they're different, then that messes with the computer systems. They're all run by computers. It ends up burning out the transfer cases. It can wreck differentials. They wanna have them all the same size. So if you really wanna take care of your vehicle and you have an all wheel drive vehicle, every time a tire goes out, Boombo, you gotta buy four of them and they have to be the same exact tires too. And generally, with the way that four wheel drive vehicles are set up, the tires are very expensive tires. I had a guy the other day bring one, it cost him a thousand bucks every time he's gotta swap the tires on. Think about that. Do you need to have a four wheel drive vehicle? Hey, this is the East Coast, right? It snows. He has no problems with snow tires on this thing. It works perfectly fine. You pay less for it, and you're gonna get better gas mileage because the four wheel drive systems, every single one of them gets worse gas mileage because of the weight, the extra drive wheels. The only vehicle that goes further with four wheel drive are the fancy Teslas that have a motor on each wheel. But that's electric motors run by computers. It's a completely different thing than a gasoline version all wheel drive vehicle. So let's look under the hood. It's a 2.5 liter four cylinder GDI engine. It's got 181 horsepower, which isn't too bad. Not turbocharged, which is good. So you got a 2.5 liter engine, 
which has a big enough size engine. It's not a little bit of tiny 1.4 or 1.1 liter three cylinder turbo. It's big enough. 2.5 liters is a decent sized engine and it's hooked up to an eight speed transmission. Now the man may be very lucky, but we don't know yet because you never know how they expand it. But Hyundai is just recalling a bunch of these eight speed automatic transmissions for an electric pump that doesn't work right. That charts out, that doesn't go anywhere. All I know is they're recalling some of those. But on the other hand, the man was smart because he leases the thing. He doesn't own it. If the transmission did go out, it's not on his watch. They would have to fix it under warranty anyway. Don't buy it, she said, and she was a saleswoman. Lease it in case it's a problem. So he doesn't have to worry. But say you're gonna buy a used one, get the VIN number of the car. The easiest one's right in the windshield right there. And go to the National Highway Traffic Safety Association.gov website and you just type in the VIN number. And if there's a recall, it pops up. And if it says, well, they're recalling for the transmission, you say, well, I'm not gonna buy that one used. Buy something else, right? That's one advantage of leasing and with things the way they are today. 210 bucks a month is actually a really good deal that he got for this. Like you say, he wanted the RAV4, he didn't like the ugly screen. But he also didn't like the 350 bucks plus. You know, that's almost twice the 210 he's paying. So you really can't argue with that. You see, his engine compartment is dirty, but he doesn't care. He listens to me. Don't put water in cleaning. You can ruin the electronics. You don't live under there that picnic, so who cares? And it does have a dual system. It has GDI injectors. And it also has port injectors. We'll pull off the stupid beauty cover. You can see it has both kinds of injectors. These are regular fuel injectors here. You can't see the GDIs, they're hidden inside. So it's not an engine you gotta worry about carbon buildup on the intake valves. It's got a system to solve that. You know, there's a lot of technology in it, especially in that eight-speed automatic transmission. That's how he actually gets better gas mileage than it's rated at low highway speeds. But it also gets in the teens when you're in town, because understand one thing about just about every SUV out there. They're relatively high up in the air. They're relatively non-aerodynamic. So they're always gonna be pretty much gas hogs when you're driving in town, because you're stopping and going, stopping and going. And like all modern cars, it's LED, and it's got a beautiful front, I mean. It's impressive lighting system. So let's take it for a spin. And the owner just told me, he thinks it's maybe a little crappy car, but he really likes the way it looks. It's got a nice look. Now, he never uses the manual shifting. He just puts it in drive and drives it. First thing I notice is it's incredibly quiet in this thing. It's, it's not loud at all. That's just the wipers going up and down because it's raining. It went over the hump pretty good. And I got to say, it's pretty comfortable to drive around it. Realize sometimes an insane car market like the one that exists today where people are paying more for used cars than new cars, sometimes a lease like this is not that bad of an idea because you can play it by ear. And believe me, if a year and a half from now, the big recession is going full swing and he decides he's gonna buy it, he'll probably get a pretty good buyout price on it at least because they'll be stuck with tons of them and they won't know what to do with them. It does have the automatic shut off and the owner just said he hates it and so do I. <laughs> it's so annoying, you know? It really is, it's just annoying. There's something annoying about it. And here we go. Hey, this thing's got plenty of get up and go. Now he was telling me he shuts off the automatic shut off sometimes and what should he do? So I told him, shut it off all the time. You gotta do it after you start the car because it's automatically on. 90 something percent of the wear of your car is, guess what, when you start the car. They claim they have better bearings, rings, you name it, but it's baloney. All the vehicles that have stop start system, I see the engines wear and they end up burning oil too early. You got a system like that, my advice is just turn it off. A new Hyundai Tucson. And as the guy says, Eh, it's kind of crappy, but I like the way it looks. I like the features it has and he's leasing it for only $210 a month. Now, of course, what I'm wondering, as I showed you earlier, is that eight-speed automatic transmission is being recalled on a bunch of them. It didn't include the Tucson yet, so maybe that'll have a problem, but he doesn't have to worry about it because he's leasing it. As everybody knows, I'm not really a big fan of leasing, but in this case, I am a big fan of leasing. Okay, we got 2011 Jeep Cherokee, and this one's pretty good reason why you shouldn't buy one. Now, it was the guy's mother's car, and it's low mileage, like 60,000 miles, so it doesn't have very many miles on it, but it's starting to fall apart. Now, no one knows why. You can see these wheels are okay. This, this one's starting to pit a little, but check this out. This is the original wheel. Look at it. <laughs> it just went mental. The back one didn't, but that front one did. You can see they're pitted somewhat. And of course, a lot of the seats are ripping and tearing. That's no surprise, right? But the main problem is, 
It's got that Jeep death wobble. That It just starts wobbling around. He's had a ton of stuff done to it. He even left it at one garage, and they said, oh, we fixed it. We put new joints on the drive shafts, right? And he said it didn't fix anything at all. It's still got the speed wobble. Kind of shows you that a lot of guys out there don't know what the heck they're doing. Now, he admitted he only got this Jeep because it was his mother's, and he knew she didn't beat it, you know, and he got it cheap enough. But he's finding out that even at that price, it doesn't really matter. Matter. They're still poorly made. We're gonna try to figure out where the death wobble came from. So we're gonna jack it up in the air. Now the front really wobbles a lot at higher speeds, so check the front first. He's already had the rotors replaced, this caliper replaced once, and this caliper replaced twice. And that's probably why the wheel looks like this. That's heat distortion. So that caliper would have been sticking on it. We get so hot, then it actually gets these to kind of burn. That's why that wheel looks so funky. Now we'll take a look underneath. The quality of these things, not so great. Look at all the rust. The entire suspension system is coated in rust. You can see the lower ball joint. You can see the lower control arm is all covered in rust. And the bushings themselves when you push on or dry rod. Even the CV joint's all rusted away. He says he's getting a squeaking noise. Well, I've already figured that one out. That's just a stupid backing plate. See how it's all rotting away? But really, if you wanted to fix it correctly, you'd have to tear it all apart. Put another dust shield. It's just a dust shield. Most guys... They'll just tear the dust shield off, throw it away. If they do any kind of work, it's not going to hurt anything. And that isn't going to cause a wobble. The wobble is more caused by, when it gets going at high speeds, all these rusted parts and these bushings, they're just not going to be tight like they're supposed to be. Notorious thing for Chrysler vehicles are bad lower ball joints, but this ball joint, the rubber's not cracked and grease isn't coming out. What you do is you get a giant screwdriver like this. You pry. Now notice it doesn't move. If the ball joint was bad, it would have gone clunka clunka. And it doesn't go clunka clunka. So there's nothing wrong with that. But mainly it's just that the entire control arm is all rusting away. And even the knuckle inside here, everything is starting to rust away. He's replaced all the tires. It's got nothing to do with the tires. And there isn't any particular play other than... There's a tiny bit here, but they'll all get a tiny bit when they get a little older. And the caliper's not sticking, it spins freely. So now we're going to check the other side. Now this caliper on the side, you can see, has been burned from heat. Check it out. It's sticking. Doesn't spin freely. Well, look inside here. And as I said, same thing here. The dust shield's all rotten away. It's not all that big of a deal. It just shows the shape it's in. This is just as rusted as the other side. You can see all the corrosion and the rubber's kind of dried out. That's the problem with these northern cars. They just rot away. Ball joint test. This ball joint's okay. But he said the calipers were replaced only two months or 2,000 miles ago. So, we'll take a look inside. And as you can see, this caliper is just coated with rust. There's no way this caliper was replaced two months ago. Look at it. It's not that much different than the rest of the car. It's all totally rusted out. And it's sticking. Look, I'm pushing pretty hard. It doesn't move. I gotta push this as oh, hard as I can to even move it. This could be the whole problem. It will get hot because it's sticking on. And then he says when he breaks and stuff, it'll start shaking on the wheel because one wheel's hot and the other wheel isn't. I don't know if I'd take it back to the same place. I'd probably take it someplace else. <laughs> and I wouldn't trust them. They said they replaced this twice. And this was the second time. This is the other side that wasn't replaced recently. And you can see it's got the same amount of rust on it. I don't know if they put on a used part or something, but Sure as heck wasn't a brand new caliper. This one actually looks in better shape than the one that they said they changed. He explained the whole thing how they've replaced the calipers on it. And he admitted that when he had that caliper put on, it was shiny, but within a week it was all rusty again. Now, they told him it was a new caliper. Well, it wasn't. It was a rebuilt caliper because the new ones are brand new metal and it takes years and years for them to rust. The old ones, on the other hand, are old rusted calipers that they shine up and polish and put new seals inside and sell them as remanufactured calipers. They're very inexpensive. I can usually get those things for like 50, 60 bucks. They're real cheap and they might work okay, but it's just an old one that's been remanufactured, rebuilt, whatever you want to call it. And that's obviously what he got because it would still be shiny just a few months later, except that it's a rebuilt one. And that's just an old one that's been polished. Get an old piece of steel. 
polish it. It looks great. Stick it on the bottom of the car for three months. It'll be all rusty then because it's old steel and it's already pitted. It's got micro pores in it that new steel wouldn't have. And it is sticky now. Didn't even last a few months. Now, to tell you the truth of the matter, I really think that the guys that worked on the car are idiots because those keep sticking. Something is making them stick. It could be that the ABS system is sticking on, the brake master cylinder is sticking on, the booster is sticking on, but for some reason that side is sticking when this side isn't sticking, and that's the non-sticking side is still shiny, but the sticking side is all burned. Like I said, they didn't spray paint this. This is just heat because this is sticking, and that's causing his car to shake, especially when he's braking, because one side's hot while the other side's cool. So I would look at the root problem myself. You would have to get a brake expert with pressure tools, hook it up to each side, and see is that one getting too much pressure versus the other one? And if that was the case and it wasn't releasing it, it's either a bad master cylinder or it's a bad ABS system that's holding pressure in on that side only. Or the line itself, this is a car from Massachusetts where you saw everything was rusty. The brake lines corrode enough, they'll even corrode on the inside. And if they corrode on the inside, they won't release the pressure because there's a blockage. So they'll stop the vehicle, but it'll overheat while you're driving because when you let go, the only thing that releases the caliper is you taking your foot off the brake and that's supposed to suck them back out. If the lines are corroded internally, it won't suck them out right and it will stick and go just like that. They told them the drive shaft problems doing that, blah, blah, no. The brake is sticking on and that's what needs to be fixed and they've already worked on it twice and they obviously haven't fixed the problem because they're using rebuild parts and not even using brand new parts and this one was under warranty ha they gave him the caliper a rebuilt one free not a new one but a rebuilt one but they charged for the rotors and the pads and everything to me that's not much of a guarantee they did a brake job with a bad part they should be liable for all the parts if the caliper is sticking, that ruins the other parts. But they didn't warranty them, which doesn't make any sense, because that's what caused it. They also told me that they had to work on a cooling system, and then a few months later it overheated again, and they said, oh, well, we had to tighten the clamps and stuff, and they charged them for that, after they'd done the work in the first place, and then get the clamps tighter. So I'd say, first, go someplace else. But just in the general shape of this thing, you can see how it is rusting away. I wouldn't put too much into the thing just because eventually the lower control arms will break and fall off because they're all rotting away. The whole vehicle eventually will just rot away. They don't coat them that well. This is in Massachusetts. If it was me, I'd probably use it as a secondary vehicle. You know, they all rust here. I got plenty of guys here in Rhode Island. They got a winter vehicle. They'd use this for their winter vehicle because it's four-wheel drive and they wouldn't be driving at high speeds much anyways. The work that the guys did just, it's sticking again and it was just months ago. They didn't do it right. They didn't find the underlying problem, and then they used a rebuild part instead of a new part. That's just plain insanity, that you're paying for stuff, and then they warranty it with the cheapest part they could find. I'm assuming it was a rebuild part. Maybe it came from a junkyard. I don't know. They could have polished it and put a junkyard part on it. I really don't know. That's why you want new parts, and you want the proof of them, the box they came in, where they were made. You need to know that stuff. So there you have it, a Jeep that's basically rusting away, yes. They do not rust prevent their cars very well, especially when they're these Chrysler LLCs like this. They were a little bit better when they were Jeeps, but then Mercedes took over and they started to get a little better, but Mercedes lost so much money, then they gave the company to this guy that was Chrysler LLC, who then sold it to Fiat, and then they started to go downhill fast. So you get something that's rusting apart that's only got 60 something thousand miles on it. They're gas hogs, they rust. Now you know why they just fired the CEO of Jeep. <laughs> because they're going in the wrong direction, but firing the CEO and replacing them with an Italian to top it all off, I think they are even going further down the wrong path. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.